Fundamental Arts and Sciences. My name is Laura Gunning. I'm a student recruitment officer here at Fleming College based out of the Sutherland campus in Peterborough, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that Fleming College sits on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Mississauga peoples. We offer our gratitude to our First Nations for their care of our earth and our relations. So before we get uh, started with questions, I just wanted to explain the format of the information session for students who are joining us. We have crafted and drafted some emails, uh, sorry, some questions that came in as emails from students, and we will go through those questions and we'll ask them uh, to the chair of the school as well as to admissions. And once we go through all the questions, then we will open up the Q&A section where you can ask any burning questions that you might have. So we just ask that you bear with us to get through the FAQs first. And if you do have a question, please put it in the chat and please only put it in one time and we will do our best to get to it. So before we go into the FAQs, I would like to pass it over to Angela Pind, who is chair of the School of General Arts and Sciences for a quick welcome. Over to you, Angela. Thanks, Laura. Um, as Laura said, my name is Angela Pind, and I have the privilege of being the academic chair in the School of General Arts and Sciences. Um, we are so excited that you've elected to join us today and are looking forward to answering any burning questions that you may have. Um, joining us today, we have a large group of folks uh, available to, to chime in and answer any questions that you have. And I wanna take uh, just a moment and express my thanks to each of them. Um, it's a busy time of year and it's been a busy time trying to make sure that we're ready for you to join us in September. And I'm pleased to say that we're well on our way to, to being able to do that. Um, alongside me today is Liz Stone, who is uh, also a chair in the School of General Arts and Sciences, and her portfolio includes the Indigenous Perspectives. Um, we have three program coordinators, Susan Hyman, Dennis Vanderspeck, and Aaron Kirk, and I'm going to introduce them in just a second and give them a few minutes to uh, have a chat. We also have someone from our re uh, registrar office as well, admissions, our admissions team, uh, and Bailey Robinson. Um, you'll also maybe notice that I have um, the admin assistant, Felicia Pavey, here as well, helping Laura and I both monitor the, uh, the chat questions. And a huge thanks to Trevor, who is in the background, always providing the IT support for us. I don't think I've forgotten anybody, so hello to everyone. Um, I, I'm going to start by introducing uh, Aaron Kirk, who is the program coordinator for uh, preparatory health sciences in our advanced diplomas and degrees uh, program. Aaron, would you like to just introduce yourself and uh, talk a little bit about the program briefly and what we're planning for the fall? Great. Thanks, Angela. So, uh, yes, I coordinate the PHS program, so the pre-health science pathway to advanced diplomas and degrees. So students coming to this program typically are looking at then entering into uh, university level science or nursing programs or into college level um, advanced diplomas such as biotechnology, forensics, or uh, massage therapy. So the program really looks at covering the science and math and uh, writing and research type of courses to help prepare students for entry into those first year um, university level science courses. Um, and one of the uh, pluses of our program, we have agreements with Trent University that this program will meet admission criteria into uh, their Bachelor of Science nursing program, as well as the majority of their Bachelor of Science programs, and also into Queen's University's Bachelor of Health Science program. And students also look at another, a wide range of other options uh, as well. So in the fall, we're looking at trying to maintain some of uh, the things we've really enjoyed about the program, smaller class sizes, really uh, supportive professors, lots of relationships between the students and the professors. We're still looking at covering all the same content, uh, just in an interactive online way for the full uh, 15 weeks of the semester. So we'll be looking at a mix of um, asynchronous delivery, so some interactive pre-recorded lectures, as well as some um, online synchronous classes where students will get to interact with each other and with their faculty members. And we're also looking at ways to include um, some lab tutorials and activities since we can't be in the chemistry and biology labs. We're still going to have um, activities for students to do um, at home and things that they can work on to really see the science in action to help them understand it. Great, thanks, Erin. And uh, for those of you that are listening and are thinking about whether this is the best way for you to learn, I want you to know that all the faculty members today have spent 
the last five or six weeks and dedicated time working on planning for the fall. Erin has referenced that they have uh, created ways and, and um, learning opportunities. I'm just going to cite one example of uh, trying to bring those lab labs to life and you will be supported and challenged to learn the science elements in a variety of those ways. So there's a bunch of different things that they're going to be doing to have you interacting. Susan, can I uh, introduce you, please? Susan Hyman, who is the program coordinator for the preparatory health sciences for uh, certificates and diplomas and ask you to speak a little bit about the program and your plans for the fall, please. Certainly, Angela, thank you. I'm Susan Heinemann. I'm the program coordinator for the Pre-Health Pathway to Certificates and Diplomas program. And our little acronym is the GHS program. It's a little shorter than our, our long name. And if you're joining us today interested in the Certificates to Diplomas Pathway program, you likely received an alternate offer to one of Fleming's health programs, such as paramedic or practical nursing. And the GHS program itself is specifically designed to uh, help you reach that diploma program entrance goal. The courses in the program are really well designed to provide you with a head start into that next program. We have worked closely with the faculty and coordinators from the Fleming Health Programs to ensure that you are getting a solid background and it's going to give you a leg up entering your, your next program. The program courses have health science focus to them, and there are the learning activities in each course are designed to complement each other. So for example, when we're learning about the respiratory system in biology laws in, in chemistry. And as Erin explained uh, just a few minutes ago, we pride ourselves in the interactivity of the program, the personal support that students receive, and in what we have designed in terms of allowing you to have an interactive approach to your learning, even though we're doing this in a distance way. So our students that are currently in the program right now are going through virtual labs. They are having real-time opportunities to watch dissections. We've planned some at home lab type activities for students. So there's lots of different things for you to do every week. You're not just sitting watching pre recorded um, lectures. One of the strong advantages of the program is that the health programs at Fleming reserve 25% of their seats for graduates of the GHS program. And you can compete for those seats if you have a minimum of 70% overall in the GHS program. You will also have the opportunity in the program to earn some of the course credits that you will need in subsequent Fleming programs. So you can earn two to four credits in courses that are part of other programs at the college. Thanks, Susan. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dennis Vandersbeck. Dennis is the program coordinator for the university transfer program. Dennis, I'll ask you to do the same thing, please, and just uh, introduce a little bit about the program and plans for the fall. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the university transfer program is somewhat similar to the GHS program and PHS program that you just heard about because all three are transfer programs. Uh, university transfer is different in, in two major respects. First is that it has an emphasis on social sciences and humanities, as opposed to the sciences and medical science. Um, second is that it's designed to facilitate transfer directly into second year university. So um, students who come to the program who get at least a 70% average overall and at least 65% in each course are guaranteed admission to second year at Carl or Trent or Carlton. Um, and five credits equivalent to uh, first year university. I like to think that it combines the best of both worlds. So you have all the rigor of the university experience with all the enhanced supports of the college experience. And you save about $1,800, $2,000 at the same time um, to get what is essentially the, the equivalent experience. Um, the program has been running for, I think, 14 years now. Uh, it was the first program of its kind in the province, which is to say, a one-year certificate program um, designed to get people into second year. It's been highly successful in that time. We've had graduates go to Trent and Carleton and some other universities as well, into all sorts of different programs. And um, we've been working, the faculty team has been working over the last 
two months or so to create an experience that will continue to give you the rigor of the university, but also continue to give you the supports of college. So we're building in a, a pretty strong uh, support network, even within the faculty community, and that's in addition to the uh, supports from the college community. Um, but we're also working to make sure that the curriculum that you receive is rigorous, but also mutually supporting. So when you're going through the program, you'll learn about topics simultaneously in different courses. So all your courses will seem to be supporting the same topics as you go through. The goal is to create kind of an integrated experience as opposed to a kind of divided or fractured experience. Um, over the past 14 years, like I said, we have a great track record and typically graduates who go on to Trent or Carleton do as well or better than students who have come to university directly from university, like directly from high school, I should say. Great, thank you, Dennis. Um, so as you can see three, from these three faculty members, they uh, represent the faculty teams and you'll be working with those teams and they work very closely together to support you. Um, and that's one of the strengths I think of, of choosing Fleming is that the faculty team gets to know you personally and um, helps you achieve the goals that you have. My experience, lots of times students aren't really sure which pathway they should be into and they need to do some thinking and talking about that. So we're also open to having those conversations as well. Laura, I think I'll turn it back over to you if you want to guide us through the, those um, most popular uh, facts okay. questions that, that were sent out and then we can carry on from there. That's great. Thank you, Angela. So the first one is for you. I know faculty touched a little bit on uh, what the program delivery is going to look like in the fall, but could you go in, in depth, please, and explain to students what their programs, how they will be delivered in the fall? Yeah, given the uncertainty that's, um, that the world is in and that we're living in now, uh, Fleming initially made the decision to move um, our courses online for the first seven weeks. In our school in particular, we have decided to have the full 15 week experience in the fall semester delivered in an alternate fashion. So there will not be a requirement for students in these three programs to come on campus during that 15 week period. Um, we've done that for a number of reasons. We believe that the faculty teams have been able to, as they've each touched on today in their conversation, uh, create the learning experiences in a way that's going to support the outcomes and help you achieve the goals that the programs promise. That was our quality is our first concern. Um, the second concern is that we are also wanting to make sure that we make that as seamless for students as we can. I know there's a lot of anxiety out there about should I should I move? Where will I live if I'm coming from a distance across the province? Um, and we just wanted to kind of remove that as much as we could for this this first uh, you know 15 weeks in our first semester. I also want you to appreciate that there's still lots of unknowns and lots of, of things changing. We know that in the province as recently as yesterday. Um, almost everyone in the province has moved to quote phase two. There's um, an area in our province that has not yet moved there and lots of people watching internationally to see what the health experience is going to be. Fleming's president, so Maureen Adamson, and the rest of the leadership team has been very clear that it's about Fleming safe and we want our students to be safe and we want our faculty and staff to be safe. And that's some of the reasons why we've decided to move that way. Each of the faculty today have referenced that it's interactive that we're using tools, but that you're not just alone. I think that's the other concern that many students have is that when we say we're offering all online for 15 weeks, some of you are coming from experiences that have no prior experience learning online. Some of you might be coming out of um, potentially a high school experience, and there's been lots of um, differences in how that was delivered and access is an issue to reliable internet. Um, so the faculty teams have designed experiences that certainly do rely on you having internet access and having a device to be able to access that, but they have thoughtfully and in an integrated way created learning experiences that allow you to do some parts um, without being tied up to a timetable and other parts that should be required to be in class at a particular time. We've done that based on their expertise and saying this is important where students have a chance to discuss an idea share an idea, show an idea, um, and at other times when you can go away and think about an idea, but you're never really alone. That's the message I'd want you to take away today. The faculty team nod, yes, would you agree that that's how we've attempted to design that? For sure. Um, so that's what I'd want you to know, and I'm sure there may be some questions about that, and, and we're happy to entertain those. Great, thank you. So that leads us to the next question, Angela. A lot of students have concern about online learning. So how are we ensuring in the School of General Arts and Sciences that program quality is not compromised for the fall semester? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So you've heard me reference and heard the faculty reference the work that they've done. So in, in the college system, there's a set of outcomes that the ministry charges us with being responsible for and accountable for. And so in the work that you've heard them reference over the last five, six, seven, eight weeks, we have built to make sure that those outcomes are achieved and that we haven't compromised any of those in what we planned for the, for the fall semester. The other piece that um, I think is important to talk about in terms of online learning and building quality is really the supports. And I think I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit more to another question later, but it, general education science in any of the schools and any of the programs don't exist in isolation. So our students are students with us, but you receive services from lots of other places and have the opportunity to. And so maybe I'll hold that answer until you ask me that in a little bit more around those other questions, but we have strong linkages and connections to lots of support. And I can talk about those in a bit as well. That's great. Thank you, Angela. You did answer this question already, but uh, I do see that some uh, some guests are still joining us. So if you could just clarify there, there's concern from students who come from a distance to attend Fleming College, and they're wondering if they live hours away, if instruction does shift from online to in class, what housing options will they have? For sure. So in these three programs for the fall 2020 semester, there will not be a requirement for students to be on campus during the 15 week experience in these three programs. I think that uh, Susan Hyman and I have been talking a lot about how many students have been asking, well, what about January? Um, January is a long way away. Our intention is to be, quote, back to more normal than what we have been. But to be perfectly frank, I don't know really what that looks like. And the housing options that are available, we do have a residence. Uh, I don't know all of the rules that are attached to that. We have lots of people who are um, working hard behind the scenes with our Ministry of Health, with the Ministry of Colleges and Universities. Um, so our Vice President of Student Experience is and has a, an extensive team looking at how to safely reopen our residents as we move into the later fall and into the uh, winter semester. I don't have definitive answers about that today. Um, but more information is coming out. So you might have noticed last week, the Minister of Colleges and Universities announced that there would be some completion plans put in place for our graduating students, and those are starting to be underway. And so our first real attempt at uh, having on-campus living is going to be taking place, and we want that to be informed by the Ministry of Health and by, again, that safety factor. So more details about that will come out. But again, to reiterate, for these three programs, not a requirement that you're on campus in the fall. Thank you. I'm going to uh, shift over to you, Bailey, for the next few questions. We have been receiving a lot of emails from students who are perhaps thinking of deferring their acceptance from fall 2020 to later start dates, be it January 2021, in some cases May 2021 if the program is offered, or to the following fall semester in 2021. Could you speak a little bit about deferrals, please? Absolutely. Um, so I'm very happy to be here with you all today and hopefully I can help answer some of the questions that are burning in everyone's mind. Um, the de request to defer a program is not a tradition that's offered by Fleming College or by the Ontario College's application service. So there is two parts to that. We are prepared to welcome students in the fall in alternative delivery and we've dedicated a lot of time and planning as program coordinators and as Angela have said um, and have touched upon in this conversation. Um, so we want to make sure that your learning outcomes are not compromised and that we meet all of those learning outcomes. So we are prepared to have you here in the fall, um, even though it's a little bit different. So we are prepared to have you here virtually in the fall. In the event that you are not uh, no longer interested in attending in the fall, um, some programs do have winter start dates available. You can add that onto your Ontario College's application, but we can't defer your application into fall of 2021 at this point. Um, your seat would not be guaranteed. We would love to see your application for next year. But you would have to wait and apply on OCAS in October when that cycle opens. And then your seat would not be guaranteed and you'd be considered along with all other applicants for that. Great, thank you. Next question is also for you, Bailey, please. We have been receiving a few inquiries from students who are wondering about tuition fee being reduced because the fall semester will be online. Could you speak a little bit about that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the tuition fees for the fall will not be reduced. The reason being is that all of your learning outcomes and your curriculum expectations are remaining the same. So they will not be compromised again, as Angela and your coordinators have um, have said today. 
the delivery schedule is going to be adjusted a little bit so that we can accommodate physical distancing. And again, as Angela has mentioned, there's no requirement in these three programs to be on campus in the fall. Um, if your program requires on labs and working in that phase, then slowly we'll bring you back. Hopefully we'll have you here in the winter, as Angela has mentioned. Um, but in the fall, your faculty have given a lot of time and thought into how you can achieve those remotely. Um, so that's kind of takes over the uh, reduction in tuition. So most of you should have at this point paid your tuition deposit. If you received an alternate offer, unfortunately, I'm not 100% sure what your tuition deposit deadline was on those alternate offers, but that should be coming up soon. The remaining tuition for your program is going to be due on August the 7th. So make sure that you pay that um, remaining tuition or secure your OSAP by then if you're going to be receiving some financial assistance. Thank you. Next question is also for you, Bailey. Could you speak a little bit about what sports and recreation opportunities will be available in the fall for students? Absolutely. So currently we're reviewing the options and anticipated impacts for the fall sports and recreation activities because of COVID-19. And that's going along with the return to campus and the return to sport plans for the province of Ontario. This semester, there will be no athletic fee associated with your tuition and ancillary fees. Um, but we're working with city partners to see if students can have access to the Peterborough Sport and Wellness Center or the Lindsay Recreation Complex on a month to month basis at a student rate, because unfortunately we can't have everyone in there all at once. Thank you. And another question for you, Bailey. So when will student timetables become available? So there's a couple of pieces to this. Generally, timetables are going to be available and they will be generated for you in August. So that's when we're anticipating that the timetables will be created. In order to have your timetable um, appear on your student center, there's a couple of things that have to happen first. So the first being that you need to make sure that you've paid your full tuition or secured your OSAP. So if you're receiving OSAP and you're not quite sure um, what your next steps are or if you need some help with that process, our financial aid team is more than happy to help you. That email is finaid, F-I-N-A-I-D, at FlemingCollege.ca. The other thing that you're going to have to keep in mind is if you have a condition on your offer of admission. So if you're coming straight out of high school, that's probably that we haven't received confirmation that you've graduated yet. And I know all of those are coming up very shortly. So congratulations on graduating if you're coming from high school. Um, if you're not sure what your conditions are, please send an email to our admissions team and we're more than happy to help out or check your Fleming Navigator because all that information should be there. Thank you. So for the next few questions, there are going to be a lot of information given to you about check this website and this email address and contact this person. So I just want to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. It will be available for you to view at a later date if you want to refer back to the information covered today. But there will also be an FAQ in important contact. So everybody's email, name, phone number, uh, website addresses will be listed in that um, FAQ sheet that will be available on the website as well. So so uh, the next few questions we are going to talk about, please go to the library website. And if you're wondering where that is, this FAQ document will have that information for you. So I will ask a few more questions of you, Angela, please. And the next one is, what, are, what resources are available to help students learn in an online environment? Yeah, I think that's a really great question, Lauren. I think that um, it's a concern, and I referenced it earlier, that you're not alone. So the faculty are always available to students. Um, once you get started and, and throughout the first week of, of um, the experience, uh, the faculty will talk about how to get in touch with them and how you use our learning management system to access resources that they've built in for the course. But there's also lots of other resources. So you reference the library uh, tutoring and academic skills sites. And so we have um, tutoring at Fleming is free for students, um, available um, through an already through an online uh, registration system. It's referred to as WC Online. And as Laura said, there's lots of information on how to go about accessing it. So that fact sheet will help you. But students can simply um, identify a course. So let's say I was struggling with math uh, in Erin's program. You type in your course number and then there's a whole series of tutoring times that are available for you across the week. You pick the one that works with your lifestyle around your class schedule, around any work schedules or other commitments that you have, and you will be connected with a tutor. Often, initially those tutoring sessions are in small groups, but students often report that that's the best way for them to learn. So Erin, for example, maybe has explained the math concept and then you need a little bit of extra practice or help 
uh, you always have the option to approach Aaron as the faculty member uh, and also get some assistance through tutoring. The other piece um, of that is um, in our library services, and there's all kinds of tutorials from digital literacy to how do I cite things? Lots of students talking about academic integrity and how do I learn how to use appropriate APA um, referencing and sourcing and, and courses uh, across the, the UT program or in each of the uh, science based programs. We talk a lot about how to do that. So support within courses is provided, but there's a ton of resources available there. Again, all online, easy to access and easy to use for students. Um, I think that you heard me reference the learning management system and unlike perhaps what you might have been used to at high school in a previous learning experience, a learning management system is just the place where an ours is referred to as D2L. So course by course, they have course shells and they walk you through the pieces that you need to do. So if there was lecture material provided or if there's a lab or there's a, something you need to submit, everything comes through that one gateway so that it's, um, we, we try to help make that easy for you and faculty work hard to, to ensure you um, are able to do that. Much of this um, connection that we make with you uh, and what we're hosted on today is through a WebEx system. So as you can see, each of the panelists through your classes look a bit different. Um, it's uh, the faculty member and interacting and it's not just a chat as you've seen today. I think it's important you know that, but an interactive piece and, and the faculty are, uh, will probably agree with me that we've had to get some good skills ourselves in being able to manage and navigate that with a group of students. And, and, and um, they've had a little bit more time now to, to get some skills. There's some breakout room features that we can use. So much like we're simulating a, a real classroom in a different way than what you're seeing today. This is more of an event where you don't have a chance to ask us uh, in-person questions, but in classroom it is much more um, interactive than, than what you're seeing today. It's an important highlight. Thank you. The next question ties into um, online still. What um, counseling, wellness, and mental health supports are available for students, especially when they're contemplating on a strictly at an, a strictly online semester in the fall? For sure. I think anytime you start something new, especially in a pathway program, and my experience is that many students come to these three programs, maybe it wasn't their first choice or what they were originally planning. So there's some disappointment in that and other times this is absolutely where you want to be and you're already excited. I think that the other part of our counseling piece is um, making sure that we have access to accessible education support. So I'll answer that part later. But the counseling is available using a series of, of tools. You can meet one-on-one -on -one with the counselor, provide um, you know, personal counseling or make referral into the community in a variety of ways. We have uh, the student um, government has connections with um, a range of mental health supports for students. Um, as, as you heard Bailey reference, financial aid is often a concern for our students and we're wanting to make sure that those work seamlessly. So counseling support is available um, using a variety of different um, avenues on the phone or online to make those connections. And again, as Laura referenced that, that information and website will be posted for you in the FAQ for sure. The next question is very important. If a student is coming in from high school with an IEP, Individualized Education Plan, how do they access accessible education support so that they're successful uh, at Fleming? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, first thing I'd want you to know is whether you're coming from high school or whether you've been out of school for a while and previously had some learning challenge in place and perhaps didn't even have all of the formal assessment done. This area that I'm gonna talk about next can really help facilitate a conversation around that. It's accessible education supports. If you're thinking about coming for the fall, I would encourage you that, that you reach out um, after the session today to make an appointment to get in and start the process of identifying um, what we refer to as accommodations. So as typically students who have an IEP um, will need accommodations. Maybe it's extra time on tests, maybe it's quiet room, maybe there's a whole host of things, whether it's medical, um, mental health uh, concern, a learning disability, a whole host of things can be addressed there. Those counsel that so that counseling team will do an assessment with you. Um, you provide the documentation or they help you get the documentation that you need to support that. And then one communication goes to the faculty. So you're not explaining it six different times in six different ways. And once the faculty have received that information, then they will engage with you to talk about in this course with these ways that we're earning marks or assessing you, how do you best learn and how can we support you in, in doing that? Um, so it's the faculty's job to present the content and support you and, and evaluate you and give you feedback. But behind them is this 
uh, accessible education service and they they can reach out and and seek additional support if you're both struggling and or you can reach out so it works out quite nicely um in in the facts that will be posted you'll see the name jennifer beauchamp who is the um person who books appointments and and again can't stress strongly enough that if you're a student in that position get that started now so that by the time september rolls around everything you need is in place and you can get uh, started right out of the gate um, and and the, uh, in the chat I see that you put the accessible education service link you can go through that to get some support thank you Angela could you mention what kind of health services are available for students and will be available for them in the fall as well yeah, in a similar way, health services is currently staffed and available for student consultations and, and will remain so across the fall. We have a number of doctors that partner with us and provide health care in a variety of ways should a student need it. Some programs that you're moving into have quite strict and stringent uh, vaccination protocols. Uh, we refer to those as NARS, non-academic uh, requirements. And in Susan and Aaron's program in particular, they'll, they'll talk a little bit about those and get you started on your way. That'll be something that in your next program you'd have to have done in advance of starting. You can imagine if you're going into a healthcare setting, you, there's going to be some requirements that, that you have to do. Um, students leave a message currently uh, at health campuses and, uh, sorry, health services on campus. And uh, we also have nursing staff uh, available to help triage and direct students into access for healthcare. Thank you. And another question related to student services. Will there be tutoring available for students mm -hmm. in the fall, even though they're studying online? Yeah, I, I made reference to the WC online system earlier, uh, learning strategists and tutoring. So a learning strategist can really help you if you're struggling with the time management. Often students say to me as they've come out of high school or if they've been out of school for a while, it's the um, number of courses and how do I manage all of that and balance my home responsibilities and my work responsibilities and all of those other things that students have going on in their lives. And so both tutoring and learning strategy is available uh, to students, as I referenced, free of charge. And, um, you know, your first line of defense is with your faculty member, but you'll hear them referring students to tutoring, always available. And if you're a student who has accommodations that I referenced earlier, sometimes some of those accommodations will entitle you to one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which is also arranged in the same way. Kathleen Conway um, here at our Sutherland campus um, coordinates that process and is always happy and available to talk with students. Thank you. Angela, could you speak about what supports are in place for Indigenous uh, students who identify as First Nations, either status or non-status, Métis and Inuit? For sure. Indigenous Student Services here at Fleming is specifically designed to provide student services support for students uh, coming to Fleming in these programs um, who fall under um, Indigenous, uh, any one of those uh, categories that you've just described. Um, School of General Arts and Sciences is very, very fortunate. So that's the student services branch that provides a range of services, counseling, um, support, um, a whole host of transitional support for new and graduating students, cultural workshops, uh, connection with elders, talking about traditional medicine, a whole range of advocacy and what ex student drop-ins. Um, but we're also really fortunate uh, sorry, let me just mention the person's name there. Mary McLeod Beaver is the person that you can connect with there to, to provide some really significant uh, opportunities to make connections. So if you're a student um, that's looking for support in that transition, Mary McLeod is available to speak with you and uh, get, get you started. They have an um, orientation uh, program that starts and making good connections with one another in community is important. General Arts and Sciences, though, is also really fortunate that we also have um, the privilege of working with the chair of Indigenous Perspectives, Liz Stone, who's on the call today. Hi, Liz, would you like to say a little bit about Indigenous Perspectives? Sure, thank you. Um, I'll just be really quick. Uh, one of the, the objectives of Fleming um, College as a whole and all campuses is to incorporate more Indigenous academics. Uh, indigenous information uh, relevant to location or relevant to courses uh, and programs that are there. So when you come to Fleming um, and any of the programs that you'll you'll get a taste of, of information relevant um, to your program. So if it was literature, it might be uh, you'd have a pick of Indigenous literature. If it's um, police foundations or injustice, then it might be talking about gladiator court systems. If it's environmental sciences, 
it's indigenous worldviews and environmental sciences. So we're housed in, in gas, uh, which is phenomenal because gas is the foundation of all the programs, all of our academic studies here. Um, and so it's a perfect fit and we, the gas team uh, is phenomenal. So I'm fortunate to be here. Thank you. Thanks Liz. Great. So the next question is for Bailey, please. What else does, does a student need to do before they start classes in the fall? So, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the main thing is that you need to pay your tuition or secure your OSAP and make sure that you've met all of the conditions on your application. So, once again, if you're not 100% sure what needs to happen in order to meet those conditions, please send admissions an email. Um, all of your offer letters, everything else has come out from admissions. So, it's just admissions at filmingcollege.ca. We're easy to find and we're happy to help you there. Um, student experience will also be holding an online orientation event for students who are beginning in the fall. So more details will come out later in the summer when we figure out the best way to, uh, to do that. And then we're also having an online welcome days, hopefully in the next few weeks and more again, more details will be sent. Unfortunately, I don't have them all. Welcome days traditionally has been a time to answer all of your questions on campus. So you can come in, you can meet some faculty, you can look around. It's a great time for your parents um, to see where exactly you're going to be for the next year or two years. Um, and that way you can kind of see exactly what your college experience is going to be like. So we will be having a virtual version of that, um, hopefully the week of July 13th. So keep an eye on your emails for that. Thank you. And finally, Bailey, could you run through uh, very quickly a few of the changes that OSAP has implemented for the fall? Absolutely. So again, we know that OSAP is a really big deal for students um, and we know that a lot of people are going to be seeking that financial support. So this year there's going to be a short information session that anyone applying for OSAP has to attend on the OSAP website before you can start your first full-time application. So that's a new feature um, that's come in this year. A series of, of pages of key details about OSAP and some financial information and some randomized questions that you have to answer before you can move forward in your application. The needs assessment on the federal side of the grants for OSAP have also been adjusted this year. So the loan limit has increased from $210 a week to $350 a week, which is really great news. The Canada study grant for eligible full and part-time students has been doubled. So that also includes students with permanent disabilities and students with dependents. Um, and we've also added an other gender option um, with OSAP this year, so that's new. So if you'd prefer not to uh, disclose your gender identity on your OSAP applications, you're no longer obligated to do so. Um, there's lots of new changes. Um, most of them will depend on exactly what your situation is, um, but they're all available on the OSAP website. And our financial aid team, as I mentioned earlier, are more than happy to help you through that process. Thank you. I do, so that concludes the the set questions that we received via email from students. So I would like to open it up to our attendees online here if they have any burning questions that we have not covered to put in your question in the chat. And while we're waiting for those questions to come in, we, I do see that some have already come in and some uh, have received answers already. But Angela, I just wanted to you know, repeat again one more time, please, that the delivery form, what is the delivery format for the programs in the School of General Arts and Sciences? Yes, so all three programs that we're talking about today and, uh, will be delivered uh, online for the fall, full semester during the fall, full 15 weeks. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat that we're, we're referencing that and Dennis answered answered those. Um, Susan or Aaron and maybe Dennis, do you, do you wanna add anything to how that delivery might be working? Dennis, can I start with you? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I can speak for the other two gas programs as well when I, when I say that um, no one currently designing the program um, assumes that students will come to the experience fully confident about all the technology and ready to go. Um, there was no assumption, certainly on the part of, of my development team, uh, that people are instantly ready to go into D2L in the learning environment, and instantly ready to use WordPress, instantly ready to use Microsoft Teams when we're happy. Um, so there's going to be a large training component and patience component uh, involved in that transition into online learning. So uh, I think there's a lot of sort of ambient anxiety about taking online courses. And I, I think we're fully aware of that and we're planning for it. So I, I hope that it won't play too great a role in people's decision whether or not to enroll this semester. 
because uh, we're all kind of in it together and we're going to recover each other. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. I think that's a really great point is that uh, we'd want you to know if you're considering coming to join us in the fall that we will be working alongside you to support you in getting whatever skills you're going to need. And we appreciate the distress that that can cause when, you know, if you think about um, coming into the building and coming into class and, and feeling confident that you would be able to navigate some of that, there's always would have, always would have been some anxiety about, will I find the right room and how will I know what tools and what's expected of me? But in the online world, I think it's made that anxiety is heightened even more. And so Dennis, your point's a good one, that the faculty teams know that and are have planned for and are designing ex learning experiences that allow in the first number of weeks for you to get used to the tools that, that we're going to be using um, and, and and be clear our programs were originally designed to be done face to face and we've spent a lot of time and resources in making sure that we have put those other additional steps in place for you when Bailey references that um, welcome days and how people would typically like to come and see where you're physically going to be spending time I know that what the orientation team is planning is is a virtual tour of the campus but also trying to show you some of the uh, of the techniques and so in this format I don't want you to leave us with the perception that this is how a WebEx would be run this again is an event that's hosted so that you um, so that, that we're not all talking over one another, but in a classroom, it's much, much more messy than that. And the faculty will establish rules with you. And as a class, you will build those rules together. So it, you'll be a, a full participant in that. And, and that will decrease people's anxiety for sure. Um, Susan or Aaron, would you like to add anything? Um, maybe I'll just add that students can expect as well. They will have a timetable. Um, generated so some classes will have synchronous components where everyone is on at the same time with the professor um, and asynchronous components that you're completing on your own time uh, with the guidance of what needs to be done and um, when it needs to be completed by so there it won't just be a sort of unstructured week where you have a task list to do and have to do it all on your own um, there will be some structure to the week in terms of regular class times to meet with your professors um, and regular activities that you're completing outside of that as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Erin, we we often use those terms synchronous and asynchronous, and we know, we think we know what those mean uh, among among our own discussion. But for, for folks that aren't used to that, Erin's made that really important distinction between synchronous, meaning times when you're expected to come at a set time and join in to conversation or participate in something and do it together with your classmates and your faculty and asynchronous when there's times when you do need to go away and do things on your own. That might be read a chapter or read, read a, a set of pages or do a practice sheet or something, do some homework, right? At times when you're not tied at specific times. So that's a really good point. Susan, did you wanna add anything? I, I did, Angela. I just wanted to also mention that faculty are very, very available to students that um, in our normal operations where students would have a chance to drop by our offices, um, that now has switched to this online type of format, but um, we still have WebEx office hours um, where students can drop in. We, we are sitting in our rooms just as we would be sitting in our offices and students can know that say on Wednesdays from 10 to 11, you can come and see me to ask questions about biology or, or math, but that you can also schedule times um, through email. We can communicate with you through email. We can set up if you'd rather communicate by phone. We have ways of, of setting that up as well. Um, so it, we do have access to all of your faculty and we do want you to connect with us one-on-one uh, -on -one so that we can address any concerns that you have or provide uh, support in your, in your courses. Thanks, Susan. The other observation I want people to know is that in each of the teaching teams, um, they work together as well. So you've heard each of them talk about the connections and integration of the, of the content, but the faculty teams talk to one another and they share ideas. So if something's working really well in one course, the faculty member will share that with the rest of the teaching team. And so they're very connected in ways I think that often surprise many students when they come to post-secondary. These are, are pathway programs intended to support students in getting uh, outcomes and skills that they need to be successful at their next step. Um, in Dennis's case, they move into second year university. Susan and Aaron, they move into a healthcare program that is a really competitive program. And, and the connections that each of these faculty members has made with those other programs, in Dennis's case, often at Trent University, because it's close to us, 
um, they bring back what they need. And so the paramedic um, program, um, Susan and I were just meeting with the paramedic team and Aaron not, not long ago to have a conversation about what's coming and what are the changes and how will things work. Um, so we're making sure that we're always keeping our eye on the goal for you as, as learners of what's your next step as well. Thank you. So if it, I'm just going to give our uh, attendees a couple more minutes if they want to uh, ask a couple more questions in the chat. If not, and while we're waiting for any questions, I just wanted to repeat again what we've said throughout the session today, that your faculty is there to answer your questions. Your program coordinators are the best people, the best point of contact that you can have about program specific questions and all other teams at Fleming are here to support you as well. So if there happens to be uh, that you get a question sometime later today and you're not sure who to ask that question, you can send it to our general inquiries email address, which is ask us at FlemingCollege.ca. That's right on our landing page, FlemingCollege.ca. You'll see a little contact us buttons on the on the bottom right hand side and that email address comes to recruitment and then we funnel that question to the appropriate person and uh, just to let you know we also have live chat on our website monday to friday a couple of hours in the morning and a couple of hours in the afternoon as well because we're here to connect with you and we're here to let you know that we want you to be successful and that we're looking forward to you having us join us uh, in the fall so I don't see any further questions right now coming in. So unless any other panelists would like to add any remarks to what I've just said, if not, Angela, Susan, anything else? Susan or Erin, you, we good? I want to say something. Of course, Liz. Sure. I just I forgot to mention that uh, one of the things that Fleming has is the Indigenous Perspective designation, which, contrary to people's first reaction, is not for Indigenous students. It's for all students at the college, and it's a special designation um, that students in in courses and programs can get. And the Pathways programs that are at Fleming and in the General Arts and Sciences, GHS, PHS. Um, have the Indigenous Perspective designation into the programs that they're transferring into. So um, practical nursing program, pharmaceutical, those other um, health programs within, uh, within Fleming, which is really important because that's a designation and education as well as experiential learning that, that you wouldn't normally get. And it's a, again, when you graduate, it's just special designation on your diploma, as well as those experiential opportunities. And the university transfer program, uh, which Dennis was speaking about, has a partnership agreement and transfer agreement with the University of Trent, where students that um, pass that or go through the, the university transfer program can go right into the second year of the Bachelor of Indigenous Education at Trent University, which I think is really important to identify because it is a education program that isn't offered um, at a lot of other universities. And it's something that Fleming, again, has that partnership to transfer right into um, the students from the university transfer. So those are opportunities as Fleming students in the, in the programs at GAS that you'll have that other students won't have. So I would for sure ask and find out information about that. And remember, it's not for Indigenous students, it's for all students. So make sure that you ask those questions. And my office is right along the whole gas hallway. Um, and so we can answer any of those questions and, and let you know how you go forward and do that. Thanks, Liz. The other piece I'd want uh, students who are considering joining us in the fall to know is that even though we're not physically on campus, we are available to you in multiple ways. Um, Susan and Aaron and Dennis are uh, about to start some vacation period, but all of them will have auto replies on their email should you choose to email them that will bounce and ultimately end up with Felicia and I. And uh, we're happy to answer your questions because we know it's a big decision uh, that you have in front of you. And we would love to see you join us in the fall. And we want you, the, the parting message would be that we want you to know that we are here to support you and we'd be thrilled to have you study with us. Thank you. So that uh, concludes our general arts and sciences information session. This will be posted online for future reference uh, by tomorrow morning, hopefully. And uh, again, if you have any questions that maybe you didn't think of today, please email us at askus at flemingcollege.ca. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Great. Thanks guys. Thank you everyone.